Your game's balance sucks. Or does it? Over the course of the past few weeks, I've been following a lot of videos and discussions around balancing in video games, most notably around difficulty, that made me think about this topic a lot. Even just looking at the previous videos I put out, I noticed several comments which lacked understanding of what balance is, or how it pertains to different forms of content. The most prevalent and destructive view of this is the fundamental misunderstanding of what balance is, with many watering down the definition to include other aspects and elements, such as min-maxing and metagaming, that do not traditionally fit in. For those that don't know, several years ago I used to be a QA team lead, with my team's focus being on gameplay and balance. Our main priorities involved playing the games we tested on various difficulties using different builds or team variations to ensure the experience was working properly and that the progression was possible given the intended design. If the tools available to the player were insufficient, or the timed and scripted events taking place could not be overcome, it was our team's job to highlight these and even come up with suggestions or solutions for adjustments. There is more to this process than I outlined, but this should at least give you a rough overview of how I think about these topics and how I look at games when it comes to identifying issues or pain points. With this video, I want to shed some light on this process and hopefully teach a few of you a thing or two about the thought that goes behind it. So if you enjoyed this type of content, make sure to subscribe for even more videos like this. Don't forget to hit the like button and leave a comment to tickle that algorithm in all the right places. Before we begin, I need to stress I'm talking about concepts here, and all statements will be worded somewhat broadly. I've seen a bunch of comments where people take general statements and apply them to very specific examples, most of which are taken out of context in order to prove a misguided point. If your favorite game, system, or mode does something differently than what I'm outlining here, it is most likely due to a specific design decision or goal that the developer had in mind when implementing those things. This doesn't mean those designs are bad or wrong, simply that they tend to be the exception to the rule. Game design, much like creating music or art, has a set of principles on which it operates. While people can create amazing pieces of art, despite those principles, it is only after the principles have been mastered and the limitations are understood that you can effectively break them. Trying to do this without a proper understanding of the fundamentals can lead to great results, but the ability to replicate that success will prove a monumental task. When I'm talking about balance here, I'm talking about the principles, not specific applications. So with that out of the way, what even is balance? In its simplest form, it is the design process that focuses on ensuring the experience of a game falls within a specific range, based on various factors. Competitive games and modes will usually have a tighter range, or fewer but more key factors they focus on as they often require a degree of mastery and knowledge as a baseline in order to be effective. Single-player or co-op games and modes, on the other hand, tend to have a broader range, sometimes with multiple lines based on difficulty settings, as the focus is more on the experience of playing through the game or on the gradual improvement through progression systems than on the mastery itself. Because of the various progression systems and the different ways to play the game, developers often play fast and loose with balance in order to accommodate the various playstyles. Know that balance is not a zero-sum game. Since every player as well as every designer's expectation and preference for what is perfect will vary, this ambiguous perfection cannot be achieved. That is why a balanced state usually revolves around a particular range. A game will generally be considered balanced as long as what the player is allowed to do or is able to do permits them to overcome the presented challenge. This is akin to a seesaw, where execution and skill are in direct contrast to other factors such as gear levels, talents and so on. 
On one end, you can overcome challenges through personal skill and execution. On the other, you can compensate for a lack of skill with more gear or higher levels and abilities. The tighter the balance, however, the less the seesaw can go up or down, making it more restricted and limited in how you can engage with it. Sometimes there is a valid criticism to be levied at developers when they incorrectly identify their audience's expectations and lower or raise that bar beyond what is deemed reasonable. Going back to the seesaw, most people wouldn't enjoy an experience that only moves the seesaw a few centimeters up or down and would just as much dislike a seesaw that goes up and down 160 degrees. Other times, the fault lies with the players that fundamentally misunderstand the scope or design of the game or mode they are engaging with. It is often the case that the game was always intended to be a seesaw, with some people asking for a tight rope walk, which is antithetical to the design of the game or mode they are playing. In that regard, it is fair to say that sometimes players simply don't know what they want or are asking for it in the wrong place. Discussions about balance can be quite tricky, as they rely on both sides of the communication aisle using the same definitions or trying to solve the same problems. This can be difficult even under the best of circumstances, but when the two sides don't agree on the definitions or the goals, all hell breaks loose and you end up with players yelling at devs for being out of touch or devs clapping back at players with snarky or outright unprofessional remarks. Moving on to the next steps, however, at the very top of the balance spectrum, there are two other components that players latch onto, which are min-maxing and metagaming. Min-maxing is the next step after balance, where players try to take the tools and knowledge at their disposal and push it to the limits in order to achieve a particular goal. This goal will often run counter to the design and balance of the game. An example of this is speedrunning, where players will look for ways to finish the game as fast as possible within a particular game or category. In this pursuit, speedrunners will often employ game mechanics and systems in ways that the developers may not have intended. Other times, it is simply a matter of cutting down on the numbers of actions taken where these aren't needed. Another good example for this are self-imposed challenges where players will try to accomplish a particular feat with a specific character or using a particular weapon that may or may not be very good. This is also the space where most experimentation, theory crafting and skill expression takes place. Sometimes you will intentionally take certain actions that could conceivably be seen as bad choices in order to prepare or set something up for later. Other times, you will avoid certain positive actions early for a bigger payoff in the future. Min-maxing is probably one of the most fun and rewarding aspects of gaming when approached with the right mindset, as it allows players to explore and experiment in ways that many would have otherwise thought impossible. Once the game is figured out, however, there is one more step that sits atop all the others that players can reach and settle for. That is where meta gaming comes in. Meta, in this case an acronym for most effective tactics available, looks to push the systems beyond their intended and designed curve and usually involve playing the game in a very specific way to achieve a very specific result. This is most common in competitive games where the goal is almost exclusively focused on winning or coming in first. In a space where the only win condition is to, well, win as much as possible, and there are outside factors you cannot control, the most obvious course of action is to maximize the odds for the desired outcome. This can be done by reducing the chances for failure or increasing the number of opportunities for you to win. In the pursuit of metagaming, the community will usually come together and settle on a consensus for what that mathematically most probable answer might be. At times, developers will actively try to fight against metagaming. This usually doesn't work. 
outside of extreme cases. As the focus of metagaming is to identify the best solution, and there will always be a best solution. Here's a graph to more easily visualize and contextualize these playstyle pillars. At the bottom, you have balance. This is where most players will spend their time when interacting with the game. The goal of developers primarily lies here, and it is done to ensure that the broadest number of players can overcome the challenges set forth by a particular piece of content in every reasonably conceivable way. Whether you play a hunter, a mage, or a warrior, you should have the tools at your disposal to overcome the relevant challenges presented to you. In a solo or single player scenario, this means the difficulty and patterns of a fight need to allow every class to beat the encounter. Some may have an easier time than others, but all of them should be able to reasonably overcome it. In some cases, your class might have a glaring downside you cannot overcome on your own and might instead need to make use of a particular party member or tool to compensate for these shortcomings. In such cases, the game must provide that solution in some capacity. If it does not provide one, or the solution is not competent enough to handle the challenge laid out, it fails the balance check. By contrast, however, min-maxing looks to take the chosen class and figure out the best way to play it. If you're a warrior, do you use ability A because it does the most damage? Do you use ability B because you can use it more times? Or ability C because it lowers the enemy damage output? When do you use ability A and when do you use ability B? What are the benefits of each and how do they interact with the fight? Figuring out how to best tackle the challenge will result in different answers for every particular event. Through repetition and practice, players min-max the gameplay to refine the execution and make it the best it can be in that scenario. Metagaming, on the other hand, is not something developers usually care about or balance around as players engaging in this type of play are not content with simply overcoming the challenge with a particular class or spec. Instead, it looks to figure out what is the most optimal way out of all the options available to do so. In World of Warcraft terms, here is how this would look like. Balance. The player chooses to play a mage. Regardless of which spec they choose, they can overcome the most reasonable challenges the game puts forth. They might not all perform equally, but they can all hold their own in most relevant scenarios in some way. Min-maxing. The player wants to specifically play a Frost Mage and doesn't care about the other specs or playstyles. The purpose of min-maxing isn't to identify which spec is the best or the worst, but instead focuses on how to best optimize the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay as a Frost Mage. The player will look for the best time to use their cooldowns or strongest abilities to ensure they perform as best they can given the situation. Min-maxing is generally a deeply personal pursuit of mastery. Metagaming, by contrast, looks at every individual encounter or event and looks to identify if any of the specs can reach a particular output and how it compares to other similar specs in a similar situation. Sure, every mage spec can beat the encounter, but which one does the most damage? Do any of the specs bring buffs for the party, and do those stack up against the competition? If the answer is, someone else can do it better, even by just 1%, the meta will almost always prioritize the other class or spec. Inherently, there is nothing wrong with metagaming, particularly when the goal of this is to overcome extremely difficult content and challenges that require every bit of juice squeezed out of the lemon. Where it runs afoul is when metagaming starts trickling down where it doesn't belong. Metagaming is a response to a very specific question, not a be-all end-all solution. To use another analogy, Metagaming is like taking part in the Olympics. 
You need a very strict and specific regiment to make the cut, and you will have to sacrifice a lot in order to just try and compete, let alone win. You will and are expected to pull all the stops to gain every competitive advantage you can get. These types of regiments tend to be short-lived as they regularly trade short-term gains for long-term repercussions or side effects. That said, you don't need to train for the Olympics in order to take part in a particular sport, whether it's at a national level or simply to have fun with the boys on a Friday evening after work. Metagaming is not fun and it is by its very design not intended to be fun. It can be very rewarding or fulfilling when applied to specific areas of a game in order to overcome a challenge that may have been previously considered insurmountable, but it is not the answer for enjoying or improving at a game. It is a means to an end, a very specific, hard to achieve and limited end. Players opting for meta comps or playstyles when trying to compete for the top spot in a race to world first or push mythic keys 20 plus makes sense since they are operating above the intended or reasonable parameters of the game or what the game designers are willing or able to reasonably balance. Opting into metagaming when trying to do the Gnomorgan raid in classic season of discovery or when trying to time a mythic 15 key on the other hand is stupid. The game is balanced around every class being able to complete sad content. In almost all cases, the class or spec of a player is not what's holding you back. It's your personal performance or group coordination and communication that needs to improve. If there is any takeaway to be had out of this video, it's this. Whether it's easy or hard content, every segment requires a particular level of investment and output. If you are operating in a particular space, adjust your time and resource investment accordingly. Metagaming has its place in the wider context of gaming, particularly in very high-end competitive settings. That, however, is not the prism through which most players should be viewing games. This applies to both casuals and hardcore players. If your enjoyment of the game comes from being the best, by all means, go ahead and do everything within your power to reach that goal. But don't push it onto others that do not match your energy or intensity. Try to also understand that performance is not a single unit metric, but a range and combination of units. While someone may not be at your level right now, it doesn't mean they can't get to your level with a little bit more work. Maybe they started later than you or simply have a harder time wrapping their head around a particular aspect. Maybe the next time a mechanic is introduced, you will be the weaker link and your previously bad player friend figures it out before you. We don't all tackle challenges the same way and we aren't all able to figure out the same things at the same rate. More critically, however, by pushing this gameplay style too hard or too far, you risk alienating players that could otherwise fit in your playstyle group. Over time, you end up with an environment that is not sustainable. This is readily apparent in World of Warcraft, with a number of top-end guilds disbanding or closing up shop. The more these high-tier guilds disband, the smaller the pool of available players will be from which the remaining guilds can refill their ranks, as churn naturally occurs. With fewer guilds taking part in the competition, the competition itself becomes less appealing, diminishing the impact and prestige of the victory and leaving it to slowly die out. Conversely, for less progress-inclined players, understand and acknowledge your own limits. If you simply cannot push beyond a particular barrier, accept it graciously and move on. Gaming is supposed to be fun and rewarding. If you've hit the limits of your performance, or are simply unwilling or unable to spend more time to break through, 
then just stop where you are and have fun. There is nothing wrong with playing on a lower difficulty, and you should not let anyone shame you for going at it at your own pace. Lastly, if a particular game doesn't offer the kind of content or challenge you want, it is perfectly normal to take a break or try something else out. There are millions of games across thousands of genres and subgenres, each offering different experiences. Don't get stuck on one game expecting it to satisfy all of your needs at once. I play World of Warcraft because I enjoy the pacing of the combat and the moment-to-moment -moment action, but I also play Final Fantasy XIV for the carefree atmosphere and community. I played Baldur's Gate 3 for the choices and consequences it provided, but I also played Grand Blue Fantasy Relink for the continuous and rewarding progression system. Don't be afraid to try new things out. Who knows, the next game you play might just be your favorite game of all time. Just give yourself a chance to experience something new. This doesn't mean you shouldn't provide feedback or make your wishes heard to developers if the game changes or shifts direction. The only way we can improve and evolve is through communication and sharing of ideas, identifying what works and what doesn't, or why. It does, however, mean that as players, we need to also acknowledge what it is we are interested in or looking for at any given time. Sometimes the game or mode you are playing simply isn't designed to offer the type of experience you're looking for, and that's okay. Don't feel pressured into playing a game just because you've invested a lot of time into it or because your favorite content creators or streamers are playing it. Play it because you want to. And if you're no longer having fun, take a break and come back later. Sometimes all that is needed is a breather to clear your mind and look at it with a fresh perspective. Who knows, once you've done that, you might just find a new way to enjoy the game. And that's all I wanted to say on this topic for now. If there is anything you want to know more about, or you think there is something I missed, leave your comment below and let's talk about it. Until next time, I'm VTX Shiva, your friendly neighborhood snow leopard, signing out.